Okay, we're doing an energy problem, a rotational energy problem. This time it's hollow cylinder rolling up a hill. And we want to know how high it will roll up the hill, change in vertical height. And we want to know the friction force that will allow it to roll without slipping up the incline. Okay, part B is the tricky one. Part A is just an energy problem. Now, we don't have to really take into account the energy as it's rolling up the hill. I mean, the work done by friction is just rolling up the hill. Rolling objects typically don't have friction. The friction force is just allowing it to move up the hill. So the friction force is something different. Okay? So when we go to find the change in height, remember energy problems occur when you're changing locations. We have the cylinder down here. The cylinder rolls up the hill. We have the cylinder up here, and we're trying to find H. My cylinder's changing locations, okay? Most of these rotational problems, it's just going to be initial energy equals final, okay? And just to remind everyone, we have kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. We have potential energy which is MGH. We have spring energy, which is one half KX squared. And we have rotational energy, that's one half I omega squared. So we have these four types of energy. This problem right here is not going to deal with the spring because it never says anything about a spring. But it does talk kinetic, it does talk potential. Kinetic, it's changing speeds. It has a velocity here, it doesn't here. Potential, it's changing heights. It's on the ground, it's up a hill. And it is rotating, so we're going to have rotational. So we're going to have these three. And since it's an energy problem, on the left side of the equal sign, we'll have the same thing on the right side of the equal sign. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and set that up. We're going to have our energy initial equals our energy final. Okay? Now before I do energy, since it's rolling, I'm going to go ahead and find I, which will be MR squared. The mass of this thing is 2, the radius is 0.3, so it's 2 times 0.3 squared, which with my calculator, if I clear that, it's 2 times 0.3 squared. That comes out to 0.18. And the units are kilogram meters squared. Okay, so we got our I. So setting this up, 1 half mv squared plus mgh plus 1 half I omega squared equals 1 half MV squared plus MGH plus 1 half I omega squared. Okay, so I got my energy equation set up. And I failed to mention at the beginning, you can print this document. It, the link to it's in the video description. Now let's come over here and list what we have. First off, my initial height will be zero, so I can ignore this. The mass of the cylinder is two kilograms. The initial velocity of the cylinder is four. The eye of the cylinder we have is 0.18, but we don't have the initial omega. We'll come back to that in a minute. On the final side, my final velocity is zero. We're trying to find our final height. Since the final velocity is zero, we can get rid of the one half mv squared and the one half i omega squared on the final side. So we're just having to find the height. Because again, omega, if v is zero, omega is zero. They are tied together, okay? Even though we do have i.18 and we do have the mass equals two, we're not gonna use it on this side, okay? Now, I just got through saying the velocity and the rotational velocity are tied together. There's an equation for it called v equals r omega. We have an affectionate name for these at the place where I work. I'm not going to say it here in case some little children find this video, but just say this is a little equation that causes a lot of trouble, especially on these rotational things. So over here, if I solve this for omega, I get it's v over r. Now my initial velocity happens to be 4 meters per second. So this is 4 divided by 0.3 which with my calculator, four divided by 0.3 comes out to 13.3 radians per second. You wanna keep everything in radians per second, especially on these kind of problems, okay? Sometimes you don't have to do that conversion, but it is helpful here. Now we're gonna plug everything into that. So I have one half times two times four squared. That's my one half mv squared right here. This is zero, so I'm gonna put plus zero. This is placeholder plus. One half, my moment of inertia is 
My omega we just found is 13.3. So we have 13.3 squared equals, I'm going to put a zero because my kinetic energy on this side is zero, plus my mass is 2, G is 9.8, H plus zero. Again, here's my kinetic energy. This is potential energy. This is rotational energy. On this side over here, we have kinetic energy, potential energy, rotational energy. Laid out the same on both sides. Plugging into the equations we had up here. And I know it's gotten a little sloppy. It's, I write too big and there's not enough room on the paper. All right, so we've got that. Let's start calculating. This one isn't too hard to calculate. It comes out to be 16 plus zero plus, and I'm using a calculator on that. So I'm gonna square that 13.33 times 0.18 times 0.5, and I get 16. Ooh, weird, those come out the same. I don't think it always does that. It's probably doing that because of the hollow cylinder and a few things are canceling in there. We worked it all in letters like the engineering math would do, the engineering physics would do, the more advanced physics students would do. You'd have a lot of canceling going on in here. I'm not going to. Over on this side, we're going to have 19.6H. So this thing reduces pretty well, pretty quickly, which is what we would hope for. So we have 32 equals 19.6 H, and if I take my calculator and do 32 divided by 19.6, we end up at 1.63. So it doesn't roll all that far up the hill. Now that's vertical change in height, not horizontal. There was no angle provided, so I can't actually find how far up, if I pull the paper down, I can't find how far this way it went because there was no angle provided. I can only find how far up this way it went. Now to determine the force of friction on this thing, okay, we have to look at our wheel on the incline. Now what forces are on this wheel? We have mg going down, okay, we have the normal force going up, and we have friction. Friction is opposed to motion. This thing's moving this way, right? Now, if it wasn't rolling, it would be slipping. And to be honest with you, if you guess the wrong direction on friction here, you're still going to get the right answer. So I'm just going to draw friction going this way. Now, you'll notice something. Torque is ideal here. Because if I use torque, my normal force in mg will drop out of the picture. So all I have is torque to give me the friction force. And torque is I alpha. Now, we already have the I, okay? We can find the alpha because we know the change in angular velocity, okay? Now, I don't actually know the excel... Are we missing? Yeah, we're missing something, okay? But there, there's a way to find it all, and I might have to give an angle in this to find this. But anyhow, the torque, remember torque, is force times radius. We know the radius of this, so we know this one. We're trying to find this one. We have this one. And if we can come up with that one, we can find the friction force on this. We really don't want to go through some of the forces in the X and the Y on this one because things aren't going to balance out correctly. Because remember, as it rolls, it really doesn't exhibit much for friction. The friction is just there to maintain the rolling rate. Okay? Now, what we have is the initial omega and the final omega, okay? We would find the alpha with kinematics. We have theta equals omega naught equals omega equals alpha equals T equals, okay? We know omega naught was 13.3. We know omega final is zero. I'm trying to find alpha, so I gotta have one of the other, okay? Now to find one or the other, I'm going to have to add something to the problem. Now I did write this problem. I'm not going to redo the video, so I'm just going to add an angle in here of 37 degrees. So with that angle of 37 degrees, what that does is it allows me to find this distance up here. Let me drop the picture down so you can see where I'm writing. At a third angle of 37 degrees, it allows me to find this distance right here. And with that distance, I can find theta. Okay. Since we have a triangle here, 
I want this 37 degrees here. We know this is 1.63. Okay. So sine question mark sine 37 is going to be 1.63. Remember you sign when you're opposite the angle. Okay. So my length along there is going to be 1.63 divided by sine 37. And we can find that by just dividing by sine 37 on my calculator. And I get 2.7 meters. Okay. And then we have x equals r theta. So theta equals x over r. Okay. So it's 2.7. I'm running out of room. I'm sorry. And my radius is 0.3. So it's 2.7 divided by 0.3. So I get theta is, I'm off screen, bad person me, 2.7 divided by 0.3. So I end up with theta is 9. Okay, so I have 9 right there. Now I have everything I need. I can come in here and do omega squared equals omega naught squared plus 2 alpha theta. And I can solve for this for alpha. And once I get alpha, I can do my torques to find friction. Okay. So 0 squared equals 13.3 squared plus 2 alpha times 9. Okay, so let's take 13.3 and square it. I get 176.89. Moving it across the equal sign, I get negative 170. Helps if I write what I'm saying. Negative 176.89 equals 18 alpha so I can get my alpha out of this so I'm going to take that 176 I'm going to divide it by 18 and I get 9.8 for alpha now that might seem pretty high but this isn't meters per second that alpha will translate into a much lower actual acceleration because A equals R alpha. So I'm going to multiply that alpha by the radius to find A. The radius is 0.3. So it's going to drop the actual linear acceleration quite a bit. So coming over here to do torques. I'm going to torque, do torque equals I alpha. So friction times my radius equals I alpha. So friction times 0.3. Now remember my I from way back up here was 0.18. We just found our alpha is 9.82. So 0.18 times, we're gonna, 0.18 times 9.82 gives me 1.76. So 0.3 friction equals 1.76. So I find my friction force so I'm going to take that 1.76, we're going to divide it by 0.3, and we get 5.8, 5.9. So the friction force is 5.9 newtons to allow it to roll without slipping. Okay? And again, don't try to do the friction forces by some of the forces in X and Y, because it's just not going to work. You're working the energy without the assumption of friction. Rolling forces don't necessarily include friction. So the only way to find the friction force is what torques. Okay, hope you find that useful. And I really need to redo that video. It's messy. But it should be helpful for those taking the test right now. I will try to redo it later and make it pretty.